Okay. Uh, welcome, Ajahn Brahm, to Singapore once again. And just wanted to have a show of hands. How many of you came to the musical last weekend? Good. So, hope you enjoyed the show. Some of us are still feeling very exhausted from that production. Well, uh, today is the beginning of our Vesak celebration uh, in terms of the series of talks that we're holding. But uh, as in the tradition of Buddhist fellowship, we usually have a, uh, a musical or a concert to kick off the uh, Vesak celebrations for the year. But this year, it's unusual because Ajahn Brahm is here with us for Vesak. We've never had him here ever since he had even become a patron or we got to know him since year 2000. So we feel very blessed that uh, he's able to make it here. And it's also partly because um, he didn't attend the UN Vesak conference in Bangkok because some of the monks there are upset that he ordained bhikkhuni. So it's amazing that uh, some things actually work out better for others whenever things don't work out for some. And, and we are once again very proud of Ajahn Brahm for having taken a very historical um, step to ordain women to become bhikkhunis because after all they are 50% of the population, right? At least. So how many of you are here for the very first time listening or going to listen to Ajahn Brahm speak live? First time? Wow, okay. So you've probably watched him on YouTube. He's our um, Elvis Presley in Buddhism, as some would call him. Uh, some of you might have heard of him. Well, Ajahn Brahm uh, was born in London, I think in 1951 and uh, grew up in a poor part of uh, London and obtained a scholarship to go to Cambridge University to study and he majored in um, theoretical physics. So after graduating, he became a, a high school teacher for a year and as he says, after teaching kids, you want to make you want to be a monk. So uh, one of the days when he was wandering around in a bookstore, or was it a library? a bookstore and he went to the wrong section of the bookstore and found a Buddhist book and then realized that he was actually a Buddhist uh, based on the things that he believed in and that's how his journey into Buddhism began and I think he watched Ajahn Chah on television was it you? oh was it you? yeah but anyway he went to Bangkok to ordain as a monk and he chose Thailand because that's the land of smiles and I think people are still smiling despite all the things that are going on there. And so he ordained as a monk there and heard about Ajahn Chah. Then he went to the forest in northeast Thailand to study meditation and to practice there uh, under Ajahn Chah for about seven years. Nine years. Okay. It's about nine years. And then he was sent to Perth, Australia, Serpentine to be precise, to start up a monastery. At that time, he was deputy abbot, and now he's an abbot, and he's a spiritual patron to many organizations, including the Buddhist Fellowship. So that's how his journey began. So now I'd like to uh, invite him to speak on our topic for tonight, creating and managing wealth. So I'd like to uh, thank Ajahn Brahm once again for being here with us, and so please put your hands together to welcome him once again. Now, first of all, um, I do not choose the topics of my talks because if I chose that topic, can you hear okay? Things are working, yeah, maybe turn the fan on. This is like hurricane. Okay. Because some of you might be wondering what is Ajahn Brahm doing talking about creating wealth when he hasn't got a bank account, hasn't got a credit card, has no investments and is more poor than anybody else 
here in Singapore. Throughout my whole life, I've created zero wealth. And so if you had no wealth, what do I know about managing it? But nevertheless, uh, as a Buddhist monk uh, who's a meditator, who knows the sutras of the Buddha backwards, you do understand just what we really mean by creating wealth and managing wealth. So the sort of things I'm going to be talking about this evening are not the sort of things which you read in Forbes magazine. It's not the sort of things which you hear uh, in the big hotels in Singapore by these men in suits. This is what you hear by the men in robes about what real wealth is and how to create wealth. Now the first thing is, in my experience with being a monk and talking to people and seeing how these things work over the time, you often wonder why it is that some people actually do become wealthy while others do not. Why is it that somebody starts a business and it takes off while other people st uh, start a business and they work really hard and it gets nowhere? Now, why is it? Because you look at those people, I've known those people, and they both work really hard. They've both got good ideas. But for some, it works. And for others, it just doesn't. Why is it that even if you don't try and start a business to get wealth, you may have some other career, and some people have careers like in sport or entertainment, and sometimes that they really do well and they make lots of money, and sometimes they don't. Why? And before I tell the answer, I think there is going to be an in a interruption. I think somebody's car is badly parked, so you better move the car, otherwise it will be reincarnated into a lower realm in the police pound. Car number SFZ2519 and SJE9829. Can the owners kindly move your car? So, and then we can move it back then. Have you got that? 2519 and 9829. Thanks. Very good. That's one of the advantages of being a monk. I never have problems parking. <laughs> so, why is it that some people, they start a business or they start a career and it does really, really well, while other people don't? And to answer that question, I am going to tell a story from the, the sutras. And this was a story of somebody uh, who uh, was called Visaka and also had the name of Megara's mother. And the strange thing was that Megara was her husband. So, she was actually called her husband's mother. And this is how she got that name. She was a devout Buddhist and she would always give alms, donations, look after the monks and the monasteries. And she was a devout dis disciple of the Buddha. But then she got married and her husband was not a Buddhist. Now some of you may have that experience here in Singapore. You may be a Buddhist and you marry someone from a different religion or no religion. And so what did she do? Just like uh, in our Chinese culture, she had to follow her husband, but she was smart. She managed to outwit her husband. So, you girls never give up. There's always a way of outwitting your husband. Look, this is something which happened in Perth. This is off the, off the subject. But there was a, this has happened several times. One particular occasion, there was a Malaysian girl and she married an Australian man. And being Malaysian Chinese, she was a Buddhist and a very active Buddhist. And when she got married to this nice Australian man, who's a very good man, she, he let her go to the temple 
but she got so much out of meditation and listening to the teachings, of course she wanted to share it with her husband. Because when it's someone you love and respect, you want your, your partner also to share the wonderful wisdom and peace and happiness which these teachings provide. So she always asked her husband, why don't you come to the temple? No. Come to the temple, it'd be good for you. No. Please come. Just come once and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. No. And no matter what she said, he didn't want to come because he thought all these religions were the same. It's just lazy fat monks trying to get rich without doing anybody any work. But, she came to me and asked for some advice. She said, how can I get my husband to come to temple? I said, it's easy. She said, how? I said, look, this is the plan and I've used this many times and it often works. I say, buy a nice book like my Opening the Door of Your Heart. Buy that book. Take it home. And as soon as you get home, tell your husband, darling, this is my book, keep your hands off it. <laughs> and that's what she did. And of course, any man, you know what you will do. If your wife says that, it's my book, keep your hands off it. Of course you're not going to accept that. She was out shopping one day. He said, what do you mean, my book, keep my hands off it? So he opened it. And what she told me, and I have no reason to doubt her, she said he read the whole book in one sitting and now he comes every week. You see, he used a bit of reverse psychology. If you want your children to come to temple, tell them, say, children, no, especially if it's a teenager, you're not to come to Buddhist fellowship. I ban you from coming to Buddhist fellowship. You'll be in big trouble if you come to Buddhist fellowship. Especially when they're about 17, 18, when they're rebellious. Why can't I go to Buddhist fellowship? I demand to go to Buddhist fellowship. Then they come to Buddhist fellowship. Then you've won. A bit of reverse psychology is sometimes very effective. But, going back to Anatta Pindika, uh, so going back to, not Anatta Pindika, going back to Wisaka. Her husband was so anti-religious, she even stopped his wife, his wife from giving any alms to any monk, including the Buddha. He banned her. And she couldn't do anything. She had to follow her husband. But again, she was smart. So she told all her friends, in our house, even though my husband's very rich, we only eat old food. We only eat old food. And of course, eventually that got back to her husband. And he was so upset. He said, what do you mean? He confronted his wife. What do you mean going around telling everybody we only eat old food? The maid goes to the market every morning. Everything is fresh. What do you mean we eat old food? And she said, I don't mean what we put in our mouth. I mean our wealth and our comfort and our health is all because of the old karma we've done in the past. We're just eating that old karmic food and we're not making any more karma right now. So we're just eating old food. We must make some new food by giving you know, generous charity to the monks and to other poor people. And as soon as the husband heard that, he got it. He understood. His wealth, his happiness and his health was the result of old karma which he'd done in the past and he wasn't making any new good karma. He was just basically living off his capital and not making any more karmic money. And so as a result of that, he actually became a Buddhist. He was very generous. And because of that, he looked at his wife as his teacher, as his mother in religion. And so he went around calling her mum, even though that was his wife, because 
she, with her wisdom, led him into being a kind and generous person. But it's also that that's what we say in Buddhism and that's what I've seen in my life. That people who are kind and generous are the ones who create real wealth. And I'm talking about the physical wealth as well. Why is it that people work as hard as others and they don't make wealth? Why is it they start a business and it doesn't succeed? There's something more to it than your skill or your hard work. There's something else at work. And I understand that thing which is at work is your karma. And the way it works is this. It's as if there is natural laws which govern this universe which sees whether you are, whether you know how to use money. And if a person has been, like at school, has been tested, you know how to use money and you use it well, then you're giving more next time and more next time. And of course, when how we use our wealth, of course some of it is for you and your happiness and your enjoyment, but also it is for charity, for helping other people. And it is that generosity, if you are a generous person, then you are creating the karmic cause of wealth in your future. The karmic cause of wealth, how you create wealth in your future, is learning how to be generous with what you've got now. Because that generosity sharing it with the community, sharing it with society, sharing it with others, is proof that you know how to make use of wealth. Wealth isn't just for you. Wealth is for everybody. Wealth is to be shared. And I don't know how many, how many studies have been done in our world which show that the best way of using money is not to spend it on yourself but to spend it on others. Psych psychological study after study after study has shown if you have, say, ten dollars and you spend it on something for yourself, you get a certain amount of happiness. If you spend it on others, you get much, much more happiness. Certainly, I remember, I remember all the times I've been generous in my life those are the times, that's the money I remember spending. I never remember the money I spent on my girlfriends. That was a waste of time, spending money on girlfriends. I was going to become a monk anyway. I'm not going to get anything out of that. And I spent so much money on my girlfriends. But then also, I was generous as well. I gave it to charities as well. And one of the best gifts I ever gave, there was a... A Tibetan Buddhist nun came to Cambridge and gave a talk. She was running an orphanage somewhere in the north of India. And when I heard what she was doing, I thought, I have to help. And I took ten pounds out of my bank account as a student. Now that may not sound much to you, but this was 1969 or 70. And to me that was two weeks food money. There was two weeks, which I, I never, went, never starved, but I went hungry, I did without. Because I gave that money to an orphanage rather than feeding it into my own mouth. And to this day, I feel so happy and so proud of actually giving that money to somebody else. I was learning how to use money to the greatest happiness and benefit of many. And people who do this, who learn how to use money, they are the ones who are creating the karmic cause for wealth in this life and the next. It is as if the world realizes that you are a person who knows how to use money, therefore it gives you more and more and more. And I think you all know that some of the wealthiest people in this world you know, the people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, they are incredibly generous, giving much of their fortune to charities. It is as if that they have known from the past how to make money and how to use money 
so more money will be entrusted to them in the future. So it's not just the case of working hard, it's also there's an underlying spiritual cause for wealth making. And I've seen this happen many, many times. Another story from my own experience, there was one of the monks who was with me in Thailand and he was, as a young man, he was um, a very good builder. He was a tiler by trade and then he became a monk and so because he had skills in building, he would also help out building things in the monastery. In our tradition, we're not just meditators, but we also work hard you know, in monasteries. If any of you come to visit the monastery where I live, Bodhinyana Monastery, and many of you may have been there, you will find that many of those buildings were built by me. Even the main hall, if you look on the building license, Ajahn Dram was the builder. So we learn how to build, we learn how to work hard. And this young man, he was a builder. And when Ajahn Chah, my teacher, started to become sick, we all realized he needed something much more than an ordinary monk's hut. So uh, the lay people got money together and this monk, he was uh, uh, from Sydney, he became the builder of Ajahn Chah's hospital hut. So it was a, quite a few rooms with uh, the ability there to have hospital beds and other equipment there once Ajahn Chah became sick. And this monk spent a whole year working on this hut for his teacher, sacrificing his meditation, sacrificing everything else out of love for his spiritual father. And he gave so much there. Later on, he disrobed. Later on, we saw him again when he visited the monastery in Thailand to give a big donation, a huge donation. And the reason why he was giving that huge donation back to the temple was he bought a lottery ticket and won the first prize. And he thinks, my goodness, how come that I win lottery prize and other people don't? And he realized it was specifically because he did that wonderful, generous act of giving a year of his life to a good cause, thereby helping out building a hut for a holy monk. Because of that, he said that was a karmic cause for his wealth and well-being. So this is actually how we create wealth, you know, with good karma and also with kindness as well. I don't know if I told this story before, but this is a true story, but a little bit supernatural as well. And in Singapore, people love supernatural stories. But it's a true story. One of the young men who was staying in my monastery in Perth this year, he was from Germany, he was a student, and then after graduating he was travelling the world, he ended up in Perth, and he stayed for six months as what we call an anagarika, a trainee, in my monastery in Perth. And he told this strange but true story. He said at the university he was studying in, in Germany, when he first was there the first week, he just happened to pass an ATM. And he said there was a girl who come out from the ATM. There was a strange sound came out. And he said, he doesn't know why, but he took that as a sign that the ATM was trying to be friendly with him. And so he was friendly back. And he said every day when he passed the ATM, he would say hello to the ATM. And he said after a year or two, he was just sitting 
close by to the ATM on campus having his lunch and thinking about the ATM and spreading loving kindness to the ATM just like we do as Buddhists and may all beings be happy and well may all beings be free from suffering he was actually saying that to the ATM it's really being stupid how can you give loving kindness to a machine but nevertheless he kept spreading loving kindness to this ATM and then he heard another gurgle from the ATM and a 20 euro note came out and he was struck there was no one around that ATM no one had drawn any cash out of it for I don't know 20 or 30 minutes and there 20 euros came out and he waved it around he said does this belong to anybody and no one claimed it you see even if you give loving kindness to an ATM the ATM gives you some money for free <laughs> so I expect in the next few days to see some of you standing outside the ATM may all ATMs be happy and well may all ATMs be free of suffering fifty fifty dollars please <laughs> but that's a true story now that's how we create wealth you don't need pin number you just need loving kindness <laughs> but also having uh, been with many business people in Australia actually to talk with them and just how they do well and how they have been successful in business and again to create that wealth the ones which I have known which have been successful have also been creating their good karma by number one keeping their precepts being virtuous and number two being kind because sometimes people keep asking me said okay in business you can't be kind you can't be honest because it's a dog eat dog world and in business you have to be tough you have to be mean to actually to get by but you may be able to turn a quick profit but the long term wealth will elude you as people you know like um, Daniel Goldman showed in emotional intelligence that the successful people are the ones who know how to create this emotional support network to have lots of friends to have lots of contacts to be able to network and to be able to network how can you network with people you don't trust with people who are not virtuous with people who aren't kind no one likes to be around such people but if you are kind and virtuous and trustworthy of course you're a person who has those qualities to make friendships and with those friendships to make networks and those networks is actually usually what creates that success in your business there's many stories one of those stories again from uh, my disciples over in Australia business person in Sydney just about to finish up a contract with a, a conglomerate in Taiwan and this contract was going to be worth many millions for his company in Sydney and the Taiwanese business people flew over to Sydney met said we're about to sign the contract all of the discussions are finished we agree all we need now is a signature we'll sign it tonight after you've taken us out to, the, to dinner supply us with alcohol and also supply us with prostitutes that's your part of the bargain and then we'll sign and he was a Buddhist he said no I've got a wife I love her I'm committed to her I can't just go with a prostitute or even spend money buying new ones you've got wives as well that's against my, my virtue and I don't drink either and these people from Taiwan were so upset they said if you don't do this for us you're not going to sign your contract he stood his ground and said 
screw the contract. I'm going to keep my virtue. And he went home. And I was very proud of him. For him, his virtue, being committed to his wife, having a, a relationship which both people could trust each other, even though he's going to lose quite a few million dollars. And keeping his precepts were more important than getting the contract signed. So he went home thinking, end of contract. Later that night, he received a phone call from those Taiwanese business people. Are you still awake? Can we come round with the contract? We've been thinking we'd rather do business with someone who doesn't cheat on his wife. If he cheated on his wife, he'd probably eventually cheat on us. We'd rather do business to someone who is sober. Because when you get drunk, who knows what secrets you might tell others. We're thinking you're the type of person we'd like to do business with. We're coming round to sign the contract. So he did get that contract signed. He did make all his money and at the same time keep his virtue intact. Because look, I ask you, who would you rather do business with? People who have lax virtue, people you can't trust, or people you know are good people. Now I think it's about time that businesses in our world especially if you're a Buddhist, you actually start letting people know you're a Buddhist and that your company runs on Buddhist principles. There are a lot of Buddhist companies in the West. People who actually do run their business on Buddhist lines, whose CEOs are devoted to the Dhamma. It's growing in the West, especially in the corporate world and one of the reasons is, is because many of those corporate high flyers become so stressed out that one of the first things they learn is meditation. Because the whole world knows that if you learn how to uh, train your mind, you don't get so stressed out, you can cope with an extra workload without any problem at all and therefore that you can be more successful. So many CEOs, leaders of big businesses, they learn meditation, first of all, just to cope with the stresses of their work and with their meditation, they also hear many of the other um, teachings of Buddhism. So they first of all go for the meditation and then with it comes the whole course and they become Buddhists. And I know many CEOs of large companies you know, become uh, Buddhists some of the mining companies in Western Australia, because it's a big mining state, are Buddhist. And because of that, you've got people who have Buddhist values. And if you are a Buddhist company or a company which says, yeah, we you know, run on Buddhist values, you can actually make those contacts, get preferential treatment to get your niche, to get your competitive edge. And these days as Buddhism does become more and more popular in the Western world, especially in the United States and Europe, that can be your edge. Now I'm not joking because you know, I travel through you know, the West and there are many more people becoming Buddhists as a result. And so, why not flaunt your Buddhism? As many companies are Buddhists. What was it? There was, uh, oh, what's his name? It was the head of the Ford Motor Company, Steve Jobs, is a Buddhist. Who else? I think the number two of Microsoft was a Buddhist. So as many of these people are becoming Buddhists. I forget who else. I lose contact, lose touch sometimes with CEOs who become Buddhists. But what we really mean there is they realise that one of the great ways of making wealth, you know, is now, to have those contacts, have those friendships, and have those contacts of trust. Some years ago, as Angie would remember, at the 2000 Global Conference, I think it was, one of the speakers there was Professor Colin Ash, who was an advisor to the Bank of England. Uh, he also happens to be 
uh, professor of economics at Reading University and he's also the head of the English Sangha Trust, the, uh, group of, the group of people which looks after our monasteries in Europe. And he came along with a, a paper to give at the conference. He changed it at the last minute and his paper became The Economic Benefit of Monks in Society. Because he was saying sometimes people think what use are monks to the economy? We're just leeches. We, we produce nothing and take all your donations, take your food, take the best room in the whole complex here. So what do we give back? And he was actually saying as a professor of economics he taught me something they call transaction costs. Transaction costs are the money every business has to put aside for the fact that you can't be sure that your supplier is going to give you the goods on time and they're the goods you actually want. And there's always a, yeah, this is what our product can do, but it never actually does that, not totally. They always say, yeah, it's in the post. I remember just a, a concrete company. I was ordering some concrete for the monastery and I called them and said, you're late. He said, oh, the truck has just left the yard. It's only 40 minutes from the yard to our monastery. After 40 minutes, it still hadn't arrived. I rang up again and they said, oh, yes, the truck has just left the yard. So I got another operator. I said, that's what you said 40 minutes ago. I caught you out. A lot of times people lie in business and because people lie it means you have to factor in a certain amount in your uh, money uh, to say the goods are going to come late and they're not going to be exactly what you ordered. And also the transaction cost of when you actually uh, sell something that whether the person is going to pay the bill on time, whether they're going to pay the right amount, there's always that mistrust that the person who's buying the goods is going to pay everything up front in the right time. He called that transaction cost. He said a huge amount of wealth is lost in transaction costs. Basically because people don't trust each other. And he said when monks come into society, when we teach by example and get people to trust each other, giving precepts, increasing the morality of the community, it means people are more honest, trust increases and transaction costs go down. So he said as a hard-nosed economist, when you have more monks, more nuns, more people keeping five precepts, more Buddhist fellowships around Singapore, the economy goes up. Why? Because people are more honest and more trustworthy. Transaction cost goes down. So, the Buddhist fellowship is a huge, uh, is a huge contributor of wealth creation in Singapore. So, we should get subsidised by the government. Not only that, how much wealth is lost in the community through bad health? lost productivity at work because you have to see your GP or spend time in hospital. Lost, uh, was it productivity because people get depressed and upset. All of that is actually contributing to a negative input on the Singaporean economy. And because the sorts of things we teach here encouraging you to be to be more peaceful, more forgiving. Some of the things you teach here actually increase your health enormously. Every time I come to Singapore, you go to the hospitals, I've been in the hospital this morning, chanting for people, getting them out of the hospitals, increasing their health. My goodness, just me coming here is saving the Singapore health budget enormous amount of money. Next time I come here you should ask the Minister of Health for actually contributing to my air ticket because I have a positive input in saving lots and lots of money off the health budget. Even more than that, when people come here 
and they hear these great teachings and they become happier and healthier. How much money are we saving the Singaporean government on health costs and also the companies who don't have to do without you for a few days? This place, the Buddhist Fellowship, should have a huge subsidy from the Minister of Health. We're actually saving a lot. Now that's actually quite true as well. It's been shown that when you're healthier, when you're happier, when you're more positive, you actually create more wealth. So actually this Buddhism, it is actually a very strong wealth creator in this world. I'm not talking about personal wealth. Personal wealth comes from being generous. That gives you the spiritual oomph behind the hard work and the innovative power. Look about innovation as well because innovation is also a great producer of wealth. The trouble is, and this is one of the difficulties with Singapore, in Singapore that everybody thinks the same. You are trained always to think in a straight line. So you're very good at imitating others, but research and development, R&D, is not very strong in this, this state. Now one of the great ways of getting R&D, or at least seeing things in a different way, is actually learning to have a bit of meditation, because once you learn how to meditate, your mind becomes so strong, it becomes innovative. You see different ways of doing things. And when you see different ways of doing things, you're not always thinking, as they say, in the box. You learn how to think outside of the box. Because when you learn how to meditate, you get very insightful, intuitive. You see different ways of doing things. And I know as a scientist, that was my field before, many of the great advances in science actually came when people were thinking of something else, when they were silent, when they were peaceful. I remember one particular, because you know, this was at Cambridge at the time, the Josephson Junction, which was actually the way that supercomputers work. You know, it was, you got the semiconductor you know, effect is how most computers work on the silicon chip, but for supercomputers which run close to absolute zero, you need another effect which creates the same amplification effect and this guy at Cambridge, Josephson, he discovered the Josephson Junction, which is the key to supercomputers, after he was meditating. He was meditating and afterwards the idea came up to him. I know that's one of many. So if a person learns how to train their mind, keep it still because when you meditate you learn how to let go of all of the past information to clear your mind so it's not restricted by the past. You can see new things, fresh things. This is where you get innovation. And look, I think you all know to create wealth, you just can't keep on doing things like everyone else is doing. You just can't get any advantage that way. But if you see a different way of doing things, an innovative path, then you really can get somewhere. And how do you get that innovation going? How do you actually think out of the box? How do you actually see what other people don't see? Training your mind. And this is something which the BF Buddhism offers. This is our heart, this is uh, our edge if you like. Because we don't do praying. We don't do believing you know, what some said in some sort of books. Our heart, and the reason why I'm a monk, the reason why we have a Buddhist tradition of monks and nuns is because we're the meditators. And we can innovate like hell. We really know how to sort of do things in a different way. And those of you who've seen me over the while, no, I'm innovating. How many other monks talk like I talk? We keep on innovating, doing things different. And that's the way we have growth. If I'm a popular monk, and if the BF you know, actually grows in Singapore, don't do things as everybody else has. You innovate, see a different way of doing things. And that gives you your edge. And in business, if you want to create wealth, you have to have that innovation. So if you learn how to meditate, if you tell your guys 
you know, in, the work, in the office, go and do a meditation retreat. Innovate. And for those of you, I'll just mention, because um, Angie mentioned this earlier, for those of you who are scared of going to Cheng Rai for the executive retreat, I 100% guarantee your safety when you're there. So, I, I, this is Ajahn Brahm, there's no problem up in Cheng Rai. All the red shirts and the yellow shirts and the black shirts, they've all been overcome by the brown shirts, which is me. You'll be totally safe up there. So those of you who think, oh, should I go to Thailand? You know, it's, it, all that sort of stuff is over. You know, we're just talking with someone from the, the Australian Embassy in Bangkok who's also going up to the retreat and they've got the inside information because embassies have to have that inside information. They have to know so they can tell their governments. Perfectly safe, so in June if you want to go up to that executive retreat over in uh, Chiang Rai, please go. And if you're the CEO of a company you want to get some more innovation from your workers, you pay for them book them a ticket and send them up to the executive retreat. Your company will benefit from it, materially, as well as everything else. But, this is actually wealth creation. Now sometimes people think, oh, in Buddhism you shouldn't create wealth, we're supposed to live simply, we're not supposed to have money. Yeah, me, I'm a monk, but not you guys. If you all lived like me and gave away all your money, who will be able to feed me? So I need you to be wealthy. And it's okay being wealthy. I said this at the Chinese Chamber of Commerce in uh, Perth some time ago. Because, you know, with Western Australia send a lot of um, uh, raw materials, uh, resources over, to, especially to China. You know, huge amounts of iron ore and gold and other minerals and so there's a huge Chinese Chamber of Commerce and they asked me to give a talk there. And after giving a talk, somebody asked me the question. He said, I'm a Christian. He said, in our Bible it says, it says that it's harder for a, uh, it's harder for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the Kingdom of Heaven. And that's actually said in the Bible, Christian Bible. It's harder for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So easier. Oh, easier, yeah. Okay, well, you get the point. It's getting late. It's a bit hot up here. Okay, it's easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I remember that as a kid. And, you know, the... Uh, the Christian priests, so sort of trying to explain what an eye of a needle was and what a camel was. And they had all these sorts of discussion, but we all agreed, whatever it meant, a camel going through an eye of a needle, we all understood it was incredibly hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven as a Christian. And that's what I still tell this, this group of wealthy businessmen in Perth, who said, well, you know, whatever you know, the eye of an needle is, it must be very difficult as a Christian if you're wealthy to go to heaven. But we don't have that saying in Buddhism. So if you're wealthy and you want to go to heaven, you should become a Buddhist pretty quick. <laughs> and that's my marketing now. If you want to go to heaven and you're rich, become a Buddhist. Now, because we don't have any problem with wealth. If you, this is, the Buddha said, if you work hard, and if you've got the karmic resources, because you have been generous either in the previous life or early on in this life, and you've got those connections you make with other people, you've got the virtue and the innovation to make money, wonderful! Congratulations, you deserve it! But then, we have the other half of the talk. When you have that wealth, how do you manage it? What do you do with it? If you have it, and even if you haven't got much wealth, you got you know, some wealth, how do you make use of it? Now, first of all, if you are wealthy, please don't go and buy yourself a big house. People with big houses have big problems. I read in a newspaper that Australia, of all countries, we have the biggest houses in the world on average, even bigger than the United States. In, in Australia, my country. 
In fact, some of those houses are so big that when you buy them, they come complete with a GPS navigation to find your way around your house. Because they are that big. I remember going to one wealthy person's house and as soon as I arrived, it was one hour from my monastery, so the first thing I did when I got in, sat down, said, I need to go and use your toilet. And she had to draw me a map how to get there. There's <laughs> so many corridors, down this one, down that way, in the end of this one, turn left, turn right, and then you'll find the toilet. That's how big the house was. But on this story, Afterwards, I asked her, how many people live in your house? And she said, just me. Oh, I know, that was so sad. She had this huge mansion, I don't know how many rooms, and she lived there all by herself. And I asked her, why? And she said, every time my family comes around, I'm afraid they're going to ask for something. Every time a friend comes, I'm terrified they too will ask for a loan. So because of that, I've cut off all ties with family and friends. That's why I'm alone. She did not know how to make use of her wealth. On the other hand, I've met many people who are wealthy and you would never know it. They live in a in a humble house, a small house. And I asked them, why do you live in a small house when you've got the money to buy a big mansion? He said, because in the small house I can see my wife. Wherever my kids are, I can hear them. We always meet each other and bump into each other. It may not be a big house, we have a very happy family. And I've noticed that. I was, as Sanji said, I was born in a poor family who had a, what's called a council flat in London. A very, very small apartment. And because it was very small, I was always meeting my brother, my mother, my father. You couldn't escape from them. They couldn't escape from me. It was so small and cramped. And because of that, we learned how to love each other. We had no choice. If I had a fight with my brother, there was nowhere to hide. So we learn how to get on together. And to this day, I feel that one of the problems with our modern societies is that we often live in such big houses that your children have each got their own room. And you've got your own rooms. You don't always need to see each other. So you don't meet each other. You don't learn how to get on together. I remember my father saying that him and his brothers and sisters, about seven or eight of them, they not, didn't just live in the same room, they slept in the same bed. Now seven or eight, many of you may have known that. Seven or eight kids in the same room. Now that's how you learn how to get on with each other. You have to, and you do. Maybe you don't have so much freedom, but you certainly know how to love to forgive and get on with people. So if you are wealthy, don't waste it on a big house. Keep your house modest and small and you'll find you'll have much more emotional warmth in your life. And number two, you don't need a big car. If you have a big car, you have big problems. Thieves like to take on big cars. They like to steal. So if you get a small car, especially an old car, if you do get a new car, scratch it a bit. And then you can park it anywhere and nobody will want to steal it. You know, it's always going to be there for you. You know the engine is inside and the engine is the most important part of it. The outside, who cares about the outside? As long as it goes and gets you to where you want. So if you get a good car and you want to have good burglar alarm, all you need, you don't need to get expensive burglar alarm, just scratch it on the outside now just punch your three dents in the car and then no one will like to steal it. But have something simple. You know this, Angie was saying about sort of uh, one of the things which I did just because it needed to be done would be to ordain bhikkhunis. 
this is like the female monks given the full ordination. But a long time before I could do that, I had to make sure we had a place, a monastery for them. And so many years ago, we actually had a special monastery just for women, not just you know, in some corner in the garden of a monk's monastery, but a special monastery just for the nuns. And of course, when we started this, you know, we just had a small amount of money, like usual. Open up a bank account, get a, you know, a few dollars here, a few dollars there. But what really made it work was one day this man came to see me. Now, there was no way of knowing this was a very wealthy man. He had ordinary jeans and a singlet, just like any of you here. And he came and he said, my wife has just given birth to my first child. And it's a daughter. I've got a daughter, my first kid. And he said, I'm a Buddhist. He's an Australian man, Caucasian. I'm a Buddhist and I've heard that you're wanting to build a monastery for women, nuns monastery. I want my daughter to have that chance that if she wants to become a nun, a Buddhist nun, I want her to have that chance and I hear you're making that happen. And he wrote out a cheque for 250000 I couldn't believe it. You know, even me, I was shaking a bit when I took hold of the cheque. That's a quarter of a million. I've never seen such a big check before. And I never knew him before. And he didn't drive a big car. He didn't have expensive clothes on. And there was a guy who knew how to use his money. Because he wanted something for his family. He wanted to have it possible that in the future, his kids, if they wanted to, now can have the opportunity now, to be a good Buddhist. I say to you now that your kids, if you want your children to have the opportunity to have a good Buddhist education, you know they're not going to speak Chinese, they're going to speak English. Support the Buddhist Fellowship, the BF. So do you want your kids to have that opportunity you're having now? Have some great guidance, an opportunity to meditate? So if you have wealth, use it for something which is going to be really important. That's actually how we use our wealth. Because we think, yeah, you've got to have enough for yourself. Make sure that you know, you're not starving. We've actually got a rule. One of our monastic rules, and I actually, I actually practice this. If someone gets too generous, and I've done this before, they came up and they give, want to make a big donation, I say, hold on. Have you got enough for yourself and your family? Because sometimes people go over the top with generosity. And a few times I've refused, gener refused donations. So I say, no, I know that you haven't really got enough for your family and your kids. No, don't give it. I remember once refusing 50,000 Australian. They wanted to give a cheque for 50,000 Australian. I said, no, because you, know, you need it for your whole, own family. I knew them, I knew the family. They were just being too generous. And we, that's one of our rules. The Buddha said, monks, sometimes people go over the top. They get too much faith and too little wisdom. In such cases, you say, stop, no. Because our job is to be kind. So, yeah, if you have wealth, look after your family. Enjoy it for yourself. You know, you want to enjoy things and maybe go travelling or whatever. Put some aside, you know, for your future investments. For the rainy day, I don't mean sort of making good karma, I mean putting inside investment because economies go up and go down. He said, and the last one, use it for charity. These are the four purposes the Buddha said to use wealth for. You know, for personal enjoyment, for uh, family, for investment, and also for um, charity. Because we live in a world and even though our family is important, so is all our other friends. And with this globally connected world now, you all have friends in all different parts of the world as I do. And so because of that, we can't just ignore people when they're really suffering. So charity has to be there as well. And you feel so good if some of the money you make is spent in charity. And if you do that charitable work, 
you will find when you die, especially the last weeks and days of the life, when you remember what you've done with the money which you've had in your life, what will you remember? Will you remember the trip to Los Angeles to see the sights, to see Disney World? Will you remember just going to see the Great Wall of China? Is that what you remember, what you spent your money on? Will you remember the big car you, you bought or the, so the big house you bought? That's not what you remember when you die. What you remember when you die is those wonderful acts of charity you've done with your money. That's why that, that is the best investment. So when we use wealth management, charities are wonderful ways. And it also puts money back into the society, back into the economy. It makes it go around and around and around. It makes for a very good world and a happy world. So that's one of the ways which I always think that we should use our wealth. Now, the whole time I've been talking, I've been talking about material wealth. And some of you are thinking, now I'm sure that Ajahn Brahm was saying the real wealth is something else. So I'm going to just use the last five minutes to say, that's your material wealth, which is what most people mean by wealth. They also have the other wealth, which is the internal wealth. Now when it comes to wealth, a few times in other talks, especially those who have heard me on YouTube or heard me speak here before, I've often come up and said that I'm more wealthy than all of you put together. And I said that because what is actually the purpose of wealth? And the purpose of wealth is what we call contentment. In other words, you know, to what I say to be so wealthy you want for nothing. Now that's one of the ways we say about wealth. So wealthy you want for nothing. In other words, you're content. And isn't that what wealth is really there for? that money has a purpose. Your wealth is there to perform a function in life, to keep you and your family healthy and happy and also to create that happiness and health for our community. So when you have wealth, please understand what the main purpose of wealth is there for. It's not just to keep money in the bank there to see you know, how big the bank balance is. Please use that money. Make it work. Don't just sit in the bank. In other words, make it work for your happiness and the happiness of others. And that's what compassion is all about. If anything, that's the meaning of life, to create happiness for yourself and happiness for others. So if you do create that wealth, create the happiness as well with it. Because that's its main purpose. Wealth is there for happiness. So don't go destroying your happiness for wealth, which many people do. The most important thing is the happiness. So if wealth doesn't come, as long as you've got happiness, then inside you are the truly wealthy person. There is a story in my book. Can I keep going on? Another few minutes? Okay. A story in my book which actually brings this up very clearly. It's one of the famous stories in my book. Someone actually did a little cartoon on it they sent to me on email. It was the Mexican fisherman story. For those who don't know the story, that there was a US professor on vacation in Mexico. And he got up in the morning and he walked over to the pier just before lunchtime and he saw a boat coming in, a fishing boat. And he watched the owner of the boat, just a one-man boat, unload his morning catch of fish. And he decided to have a conversation with the fisherman. So he walked over to the fisherman and said, I've been watching you, what are you doing now? And the fisherman said, well I've been out all morning, I've caught enough fish for myself and my family. So now I'm going to go and have lunch with my wife. And after lunch I'm going to have a nice siesta. Just relax. In the afternoon I'll be there to play with my children when they come home from school and after a nice dinner with my, my uh, family, in the evening I'll go to the cantina you know, to play some guitar and, and, and uh, have a nice time with my friends. So life is good. And the Americans said, actually sir, I think I can help you. Because I'm a professor of business from a, a very good, unnamed US business school. I think I can help you. Don't be so lazy. 
go out again in the afternoon and then you can catch twice as many fish and with the extra money you make in about a year's time you'll be able to buy a bigger boat this time with some crew with a big boat and lots of crew you'll be able to catch four or five times as many fish and soon your profits will enable you to buy a second boat maybe a third and a fourth, maybe in about ten years you'll have a whole fleet of boats and then you can move your business headquarters to Mexico City or even better to LA you can float your company on the stock market awarding yourself preferential share options and soon you'll be able to make so much money by selling your company that you'll be a multi-millionaire so that's how business goes now I don't know if I've got that right because I know nothing about business but I think you get the general gist of the idea and then this fisherman was listening patiently all the time to this uh, business professor and said but senor once I am a millionaire once I have all that money then what should I do? and a professor of business studies hadn't thought that far all he'd thought to was how to become a millionaire and then he paused for a few moments contemplated and said yeah when you're a multi-millionaire then you can retire you can retire to a nice fishing village like this buy yourself a small boat to go out in the morning for fun you'll be able to have lunch with your wife every day and have a sleep after lunch you'll be able to meet your children every day when they come home from school and go to the cantina in the evening to play guitar with your friends he said I do that already senor <laughs> isn't it the case that many of us we want to be wealthy so we can live like a poor person look at poor people they have lots of time with their family and friends so do you really want to be wealthy so you can live like a poor person <laughs> so understanding the meaning of wealth the main meaning of wealth is that emotional wealth inside of you the happiness, the peace being at ease with yourself and at ease with others having a good family and friends you can rely on now that's the most important thing in life so when you know what real wealth is I think you understand how to create that inner wealth and you also know how to manage that inner wealth and that's all about these talks which I have given and other monks and nuns have given all about how to create the emotional wealth inside the love, the kindness, the understanding, the forgiveness, the peace inside of yourself because in the end all your kids will take your money or the, the government will take your money away but the one thing which no one will be able to take away your real wealth is that peace, that happiness, that compassion, that wisdom which you grow inside and actually that peace, that compassion, that wisdom as I said from the very beginning that is not only the real wealth but there is also the cause, the way to make that external wealth as well that's why when you're kind, when you're generous, when you're virtuous you don't only make wealth in this world you make wealth in the other world as well and that's really how we create wealth thank you for listening Okay, so now is the time for questions, comments and complaints and another car has been badly parked, is that right? Thank you Arjun Okay Thank you Arjun Brown Can you come over here? Because otherwise yeah. You find the mic can you, is it working now? Yep. Okay. This reminds me of perhaps being in Thailand in the old days where you sit in a hall and there's no air con. And oh, it's where Ajahn Brahm. Good old days. 
No, yeah, in the good old days when I was a young, they don't make monks like the good old days. Sometimes we'd ha- we'd, after lunch, we'd only eat one meal a day, so I had to put a lot of food in your tummy to last you. And then there was a little hall in Ajahn Chah's monastery with a tin roof and no insulation. And after lunch, we go in there for two hour meditation with not just one robe, with our spare robe on as well. Oh, and it was so hot. And Ajahn Chah used to tell us, you can bring your blanket as well if you want. Oh, it's like a sauna, it was so hot. But after that experience, you never complained about the heat again. That was maximum heat. So these days, when it's hot, if you're hot, what should you do? Keep a cool head. And if it's cold, keep a warm heart. We call that Buddhist air cock. <laughs> okay. Okay, we do have a car that's blocking. It's 7603. It's a Toyota. Can you kindly move your car? 7603. Okay. Move the car. Now some questions. Why are we waiting for the first question? Tell joke. I think I told this joke before, but I went to UK in October, and you know in UK they were really suffering from the credit crunch. Much worse than Australia, much worse than Singapore. And I heard this story in London. There was a rich man was driving down the street in his Rolls Royce car. There's still people rich. And he passed by two men who were so poor, so hungry, they were eating grass. Imagine that, eating grass. And he stopped his Rolls Royce car and said, What are you doing? We said, We've got nothing else to eat. That's why we're eating grass. And he smiled at them and said, Come in my car. I'll take you to my mansion for something to eat. And he said, But we've got a wife and children. Bring them too. There's plenty in my mansion for all of you. So the two men, very poor, and their wives and children got in the back of the Rolls Royce. And they said, You're so kind. It's so wonderful to see rich men who are also compassionate and generous. He said, don't think anything about it, said the rich man. As soon as I saw you eating grass, I thought of the huge lawn in front of my mansion. There's enough grass there for all of you to eat. (laughs) It's really mean, isn't it? But some rich men are like that. <laughs> Ajahn, since you talked about meditation just now, and I think it helps us to stay cool in this warm environment, or to learn how to stay cool despite pressures in our life, perhaps you could uh, go through some meditation with us for the next 10 minutes. Is that something you would like to do as well? Yeah. do meditation as Ajahn Brahm has talked about so can you just raise your hands those of you who would like to do 10 minutes of meditation excellent those of you who don't want to do meditation you can just fall asleep <laughs> ok now one thing we know about meditation that once you do calm down your metabolic rate goes down and when your metabolic rate goes down the amount of heat that your body generates goes down too. So it actually does cool you down. So for those of you who want to meditate, only for five or ten minutes, it's very easy, just close your eyes. When you close your eyes, you've got one less thing to worry about or that you see. Instead, you become aware of how you feel in your body and also the sounds which you can hear. Now hearing and feeling 
are all that's left of your senses once you close your eyes. Now how you feel now in your body, hot or aching, give that some compassion, opening the door of your heart to the feeling of heat, ache, pain, whatever you're feeling now, become one with it. Stop fighting it. You'll find when you open the door of your heart with kindness to whatever you feel in this moment, much of the problem vanishes. It's when we fight the feelings that we get the suffering. If you're aware of the sound of the fans or my voice, again, just be one with it. Stop fighting. Allowing every moment to be as it is. And as you feel your body, see if you can relax it more and more. Relax to the max. If you feel any tightness anywhere in your body, see if you can release that tightness. Open out any tensions. As you are aware of your body with the only intention of relaxing and bringing more ease to your body. And your awareness together with your compassion, your kindness, will bring your body to a deeper and more pleasant state of ease. Relaxing, relaxing, relaxing. And just as you relax your body, so see if you can relax your mind. Any tension or tightness in your mind, open it out. Any knots in your mind, untie them. It's just the same way you relax your body, relax your mind. Making peace your goal. Just learning how to be at peace with this moment. 
learning how to be content with this moment. It's not the best, but it's good enough. Relaxing, making peace, just being with this moment and being at peace with life as it is right now. This is not the time for mental work. This is the time for mental rest by being at peace letting things be Just being here, not trying to achieve anything, just resting in this moment, as if you've been traveling on a long journey and now you have a place to sit down and relax for a few minutes. And the place you sit down is called the present moment just now. So how do you feel right now? What's it like inside? Can you notice a state of peace and relaxation? See if you can recognize that feeling of peace. In the last couple of minutes to take that peace further and deeper by relaxing more. now I invite you all to open your eyes and come out from your meditation. Notice how relaxed you feel. Very nice. Okay. So meditation is very easy once you know how. Okay, so we've got the questions now and I'll try to be brief for the answers. Okay, uh, first of all, I've been asked to do a um, profile. So how many of you are staying around this area in Tolok Blanga? 
Could you just kindly raise your hand in Tulublanga area? West Coast. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm just going to take, just going to do three or four questions today. I think given that tomorrow is a work day, uh, we will keep the number of questions short and tomorrow you can come back for more. Ajahn Brahm, with so many disappointing high profile frauds committed in the name of charity, what are your thoughts about giving money to charity? Okay, first of all you have to check out oops, check out the charities first of all to, oops, to make sure that their bureaucratic structure that most of the money is not going in administration is actually going where you intend it to go. Even the Buddha foresaw this because he put rules for the monks. If anyone gives money for a specific purpose, it has to be used for that purpose. Again, many years ago we thought of building like a chafia, one of these big stupas in Australia. So a lady, again, she gave $50,000 check to build our stupa and it was, and it was put, put in our, our bank, bank account. account. And, and then, then we decided we didn't, we didn't want to build, build it. it. So, so I went, went back, back to see that lady and say, here's, here's your money, your money back, back because we're not going to build it. I had to do that because we can't use it for anything else. And then she said, okay, okay, no, you use it for whatever you want to. And then I could actually keep it in the account. But if she hadn't said that, we have to give the money back. If you, if you give, give it for it one, one purpose, purpose it, has it has to be used, to be used for that, that purpose. purpose. So I think that's that charity should have that same law. law. If you, you give, give to, say, the you know, National, National Kidney, Kidney Foundation, Foundation, you know, for a dialysis, dialysis machine, machine, it should be used, used for that dialysis, dialysis machine, machine and not for admin. admin. And this and is this really is important that we know where our money is going. And the account should be publicly available. So we can all see what's going on. They shouldn't be just kept just for just a few people to see, but should be public available. Are the BF accounts publicly available? They should be, so you can see what the Buddhist Fellowship are doing with your donations. Our accounts are publicly available in Perth, because without that you don't know where things are going. So that's my... But Check out those charities. There are bogus charities, but there are some very good charities as well. So, do your research, find out the charities where your donations get the best results. Ajahn Brahm, how important is luck or superstition in doing business? Luck or superstition, oh, I want to say superstition is obviously irrational, doesn't work. Luck doesn't work as well. It's all karma. Whoops. There is a reason there why you're successful. Maybe you can't see that reason and you put it down to luck, but it's not luck. If your business is successful, you know, it means you have that uh, karmic causes from the past. And this is what the Buddha said and this is how I see it too. It's your generosity in the past. That gives you the extra ingredient that your hard work and innovation makes your business work. You might put it down to luck. People might think it's luck, but it's not luck. It's karma is working. <laughs>